event, which is being co-organized by Diplo uh, with the Fushi Institution. My name is Marilia Maciel. I am head of digital commerce and internet policy at Diplo Foundation. I will have the pleasure to serve as the moderator of this session today. So 30 years ago, on 20 April uh, 94, China became the 77th country to go online and connecting with the global internet. And that was a time of a blooming globalization in which uh, West and we East were becoming deeply intertwined by technological development. And that reinforced the trend of global interdependence in terms of trade, um, finance, global value chains that had been already identified uh, in the 70s by Joseph Nye and Professor Kyo Hain. So we are here today to, first of all, to celebrate this remarkable event. Um, it represents the opportunity to include uh, not only a significant part of the global population, 1.4 billion people to be more exact online, but also uh, it's an opportunity for the world to have access uh, to the torrent of innovation and that has been produced by this incredibly uh, rich society and business uh, sector. On the flip side, the internet has also transformed uh, China and Chinese society a lot, and we will hear a little bit more about that in our discussion and today. I would even dare to say that uh, technological progress has become intimately correlated uh, with China's goal of uh, modernization and that displays of this technological uh, prowess have become points of national pride and real symbols of this modern China today. But the way that China relates to the digital world and to the West has also changed uh, too. China is not just a consumer of a Western technology anymore, but it's also a global exporter. And the presence of China is considerably felt today in all internet layers, from telecommunications uh, to standards, uh, to applications, and increasingly in regulation um, as well. And this affects the distribution of global uh, power. Uh, more recently, we saw that telecommunications and mobile technology have become uh, well-established uh, fields of geopolitical uh, rivalry and competition between our two big global powerhouses in the digital realm today, the US and China. And this dispute uh, is somehow spreading through the vast array of so-called critical emerging technologies, which include artificial intelligence uh, today. So as these tensions arise, uh, measures have been put perhaps by both sides here to restrict access to each other's digital markets. And we're going to explore a little bit more about the consequences of that on digital interdependence and on digital governance more generally. So a lot of thought-provoking questions today, and I'm really happy that we have put together an amazing panel to discuss these questions. We will have with us uh, Jovan Kurbalia, who is director um, of Diplo and head of the Geneva Internet uh, Platform. We have a uh, Professor Li Xiaodong. Um, he is the founder and the chief executive officer of Fushi Institution, and he's also a professor at Tsinghua University. Uh, we have Professor Liu Hao, he's executive chair of the School of Global Governance uh, in the Beijing Institute of Technology. Um, professor Rohir Kremers, he's assistant professor and lecturer in modern Chinese studies at the Leiden University. And Serena Teleano, um, who is director of knowledge at uh, Diplo. I must say that we are also very grateful for receiving two very special messages with reflections about this uh, 30 year anniversary and wishing us a good seminar today. Uh, we received messages from Madame Hu uh, Ki Heng, uh, China's internet pioneer and global connector. Uh, we could consider her the mother of the Chinese internet. And Vit Surf, who is a vice president and chief internet evangelist at Google and one of the fathers of the internet. So I would like to invite you to please go online and take a look at this uh, full context of these uh, messages and we will leave the link to the page where you can find these messages um, in the chat. Our discussion uh, will take place as well in the chat. Uh, the chat discussion will be mod moderated by my colleague, Sonia Herring, 
and she's Digital Media and Communications Editor at Diplo. And this is a very short session, so questions will be forwarded via chat only. So Sonia will collect them and forward the questions at the end. Um, I, this also means because uh, we don't have much time that I will need to be a little bit strict with time, so I apologize for interrupting any of the speakers in advance if I have to. Um, and we have a hard stop in one hour. So I would like to go down directly to the first round of questions that we have for discussion today. In this first block of questions, we'll try to look back um, at this past 30 years, and I will invite uh, Professor Jovan Kurbalia and Liu Hao to share their reflections. Um, we have some questions in this block. Um, first of all, what are some of the factors that helped you explain and China's rapid global digital development, how connecting to the internet has transformed uh, China itself, and how has China's technological, economic, political presence in the digital landscape influenced the development of the internet? So we have a question at different levels, world, China, internet. What has changed in this last uh, uh, year? So um, to start, I will give the floor to Jovan. Uh, please go, Jovan, go ahead. Thank you, Marilia. I'm really honored to, to address uh, today's meeting uh, and congratulations to our Chinese colleagues. Uh, and I will say to all of us, because it has be, this is the remarkable event for of the global relevance. I'm connecting uh, from Dublin, where I just uh, delivered a keynote address on the conference on AI and religion. And uh, uh, in the preparation for this event, uh, I was asking myself about uh, both deeper historical reasons for success of uh, internet in China and possible indications about the future. And I came to the uh, interesting uh, uh, fact that when uh, Deng Xiaoping, father of the opening of China in 80s, decided to move, uh, to shift uh, the promote opening one of the uh, most important book, which was translated in Chinese, was Max Weber's book on Protestant ethic and the spirit of the capitalism. Therefore, he understood very early that uh, it's not just uh, opening, taking technology, or but also understanding context in which uh, this technology is developed. And this is a fascinating artifact. It was translated and it was almost compulsory reading for all people involved in this transformation. Uh, another, and that book explains the main elements of the modernization, industrialization in Western society. Max Weber argued for the Protestant ethic to be underlying uh, behind that. And adoption in the, in the Chinese uh, uh, context through industrialization, modernization prior to the 80s and the Deng Xiaoping's uh, uh, opening, but also inspiring uh, this change. That was an interesting uh, must reading and interesting connection. The second, let's say, historical uh, moment was uh, uh, um, 2004, where uh, together with uh, Madame, uh, Madame uh, Hu Qinghui, who sent the message, I was member of the working group on internet governance. And uh, I uh, realized at that point uh, the really strong uh, push for, towards convergence and sharing understandings of the internet with how internet should be governed with all, all specificities which we shouldn't shy away and uh, differences in that, that process. And it was uh, then my book was translated and uh, really continuous exchange with Madam who uh, started uh, on many issues, including controversial issues. And uh, it, was, it was a fascinating friendship which I cherish a lot. And uh, uh, in these two elements, let's say deep thinking you can find ingredients for the future where on not only on technologies, on data, on AI, on the whatever we use, but in deeper understanding, societal, cultural understandings, we can build regulation of AI, use of AI and other tools. And uh, all sides in this discussion, we usually simplify it to the United States and China, which is the most prominent, but I would say other societies should contribute to it, definitely from China, through Taoism, to Confucianism, to deeper thinking from European side, from the antique thinking, from Judeo-Christian tradition, but also Ubuntu civilization from Africa and other places. Therefore, that what uh, Deng Xiaoping started with the book, Max Weber's book, and basically paid the way for the 
uh, modernization and digitalization, an important agent of it, should continue. We have to uh, be aware of differences, not shy away from controversies, but also look for some sort of common and shared, if I can call it, operating system when it comes to values, philosophy, and uh, benefits that we are gaining from technology. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing these reflections, Jovan. And I would like to come back to them towards the end when we think about the commonalities that uh, we have um, as countries that want to build the internet together. But let me pass directly, uh, mindful of time, to Professor Liu Hao for him to share his reflections. Uh, thank you, Mariela. I would like uh, to start with uh, with the history to follow the practice of uh, Yubin. So, you know, China is a, a country have a long history, but uh, unfortunately in the 20th century, China suffered a lot. So for such a sharper comparison makes every Chinese people want to have a faster development. So the Chinese people, we don't sleep. We try to grab any opportunity to develop faster. I think this is a quite important reason for the faster development in the past 30 decades for the internet and the digital development. Secondly, that... Uh, China is, has a strong central government, and this government has uh, also uh, additional ways of policy making to promote and uh, support the digital development. This is the second reason. And certainly, the market dynamics and the, the size of market, the massive domestic market of China provide a vast opportunity for the scale and the growth. So it's uh, for such a market, big market benefit and also attract uh, both domestic and international investment. And the fourth factors for the development in the past three decades was the technology the innovation and adoption. At the beginning, especially for the uh, first and second generation of telecommunication, China is transplanting and adoption roles of product and the technology innovated in Europe and uh, uh, America. In the third and fourth generation, China is engaged in the innovation already. And when we come to the 5G, China became the main player and are highly connected with the world innovation ecosystem. Uh, the last reason is that uh, the international collaboration, even sometimes disrupted or going parallel with the roles of conflict. As globalization increased, so did the flow of technology and ideas. So such international collaboration benefits a lot for the faster development of China. Well, uh, for the second question, which connecting to the uh, uh, how that uh, the global connection changed the development of China, I think the first, the political system with uh, easy, cheaper internet connection, almost every part of the world of, of China have access to the uh, democratic system so we are really coming to a new stage of a democratic system. And this also help the government to uh, improve its governance. So this is the political uh, uh, influence. The second economic growth. The internet had been a powerful engine for the economic development and contributing to uh, uh, the digital uh, transformation that impacts very aspects of uh, uh, the Chinese economy. The third, because I'm working in a university, I feel the big uh, influence of uh, the internet to the education and the society. Now in China, the students, the professors are well connected with the international uh, community. We don't just reflect or learn roles of knowledge, roles of uh, uh, um, experience in China, but every part of the world. Fourth is a cultural exchange. The rise of the internet had transformed the China the media landscape, reducing the influence of a traditional mass media and giving rise to a digital media platform. Uh, the faiths are the innovation and the technology. As I had mentioned, China started from adoption of the technology, moved to the engaging and then contributing to the global innovation of the science, technology, and uh, 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 engineering. Uh, the last question is how is that uh, China's uh, development influence the world? I think uh, I just wanted to address the following three. First is economic impact 
the integration of the internet into China's economic strategy has significantly boosted its GDP with a notable impact on the global market. So China's digital economy has been a major growth driver for the uh, world economy, even during the pandemic season. This is the first. And secondly, is the technological innovation and the standards. China has played a pivotal role in shaping global technology standards through its sum of advancement in digital technology. This influence extends from telecommunication equipment to newer areas like uh, uh, Yuvan just mentioned, the 5G uh, communication, the digital commerce, and also the AI. Last one is the global digital influence. Through the initiative like the digital Silk Road, China has extended its digital infrastructure to developing countries, influencing their digital landscape and enhancing its global outreach. So I don't want to say that this is a China-centric. No, it is a China-connected digital network. I will stop here and uh, I will be happy to join the other, uh, the later discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Liu Hao. You covered a lot of uh, ground in your reply. Thank you for that. And I particularly like how you emphasize the role of collaboration and how it benefited and China. And I would just emphasize that it benefited the West to this interplay and this interchange between China and the West has also provided higher than average returns to early investments in telecommunications, which provided the capital and the resources to develop much of the technology in the West uh, um, as well. And I really like the point that you made on how China progressed uh, as a developing country. I think that this is the path that many other uh, developing countries would like like to follow in terms of uh, acquiring technology, but also becoming producers of this technology. So in that sense, there's a lot of to study in the Chinese uh, model um, as well. Thank you very much for this first round. I would like to pass directly to the second round in which we will examine more uh, in detail some present uh, trends that we can find in China's engagement with global digital policy more uh, specifically. In this uh, second round, I will uh, call Professor Li Shandong, um, Professor Rohir Kremers, and uh, my colleague Sorina. And we, as we discussed uh, China's presence in all three layers of the internet, telecommunications, standards, um, and applications is increasingly um, felt. And as was emphasized in this conversation, uh, the country has become an exporter um, of innovation uh, in the application layers as well. Uh, TikTok is one of uh, the notable examples, but is far from being uh, the only one. And China is also enacting a wide range of digital legislation on data security, uh, personal information protection, digital governance, and has recently um, relaxed these restrictions on uh, data flows, which was uh, quite interesting considering uh, the international scenario of digital trade negotiations uh, right now. So I would like to ask the speakers to reflect a little bit in this uh, present uh, trends, uh, starting by uh, Professor Li Xiangdong. Professor Li. Yes. Uh, you're right. You know, you know, in the past three years, there are so many uh, internet companies uh, get a lot of support of the, the capital and then they have the technologies, have a good team. So they try to extend their business globally. And, uh, you know, uh, including such as you mentioned TikTok and the Tencent and that these, some Indian uh, company in China. So they try to bring their capital outside China and uh, export their business model in other countries. So in some sense, some of them are very successful, uh, including the e-commerce and uh, instant message and also the social networks. So, so, but you know, uh, in recently, I think that's a big challenge for them. So, because, you know, there's a, some, uh, some kind of global policy conflict. Yeah. You know that even uh, in Europe, they have GDPR and America have their policy and China, they have published their data security law and personal information protection law. So now there's some kind of conflict among those uh, uh, regulations. So that's a big challenge for China uh, internet company to extend their business uh, overseas. So, so, but, you know, uh, the, the government, you know, uh, try to encourage them to go abroad. Go abroad. So just like uh, in uh, 30 years ago, when China internet development, 
So the lack of money, lack of the talent, lack of the capital. So there's because the open policy just mentioned by German and also Madam Gu, the open policy was uh, 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 defined by the uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping. So this transcend a lot of people uh, go abroad for study, and then when they get that degree and they have the have their experience in America, they back to China, open the the first round in the company in China. So now I think it's it's, uh, it's some uh, some right time for China to doing something for for other countries. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I mentioned is uh, America, Europe, because you know uh, ch- so many Chinese company go to uh, uh, South Asia to open their their company to to develop the internet for for in these regions. So so I think it's, uh, uh, the past thirty years uh, is. Uh, they have a uh, very successful in uh, domestic market and uh, now try to extend the uh, the overseas market but i i i think it's, I, i'm not sure if they can be successful or not because you know that's the big issue for tiktok american so they challenged uh, that uh, the relationship between tiktok with china they worry about the data security uh if they can transfer the data from America to China, and what's the relationship between those countries with the Chinese government? There's a lot of uh, worry about the, the data security issues. So I think now is a challenge, and uh, uh, the the company need to work together with the uh, Chinese government and also the the local government together to find some kind of, kind of possible solution to solve those issues. Otherwise, you know they will fail. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Li. And uh, I like how you mentioned this need for collaboration, even among um, non-governmental actors, which were uh, most of all the ones to develop the internet in its early days. And um, I just finalized my thesis um, in a topic related to China, the securitization of information and communication technologies and services in this bilateral um, relation. And I could see how the private sector in both uh, countries uh, wants to foster collaboration and it's not really fueling uh, the disputes but is trying to make sure that uh, relations remain stable, predictable. Um, so that was a very interesting comment from my perspective. Um, uh, Professor Rohir, perhaps I will call you now to share your reflections. How do you see uh, the current landscape today? Thank you so much, Marilia. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, thank you to the Diplo Foundation and the Fushi Institution for sponsoring this uh, very interesting colloquium. Uh, I have very pleasant experience working together with the good people at Fushi, amongst others, in their participation in the Wujin World Internet Conference. And that is also always uh, a pleasure. Um, what I would like to reflect a little bit about is um, the nature of change. And I think, you know, it is a wonderful uh, anniversary and a wonderful occasion and a wonderful opportunity 30 years tomorrow of the internet uh, in China to think a little bit about what it means. And certainly for me, it means a lot. If the internet didn't exist, I wouldn't have a job. And indeed, very many people in this room wouldn't have a job either. Um, but also when we think about the evolution of the internet uh, from a very basic communications technology, I remember when my home first got connected to the internet, that took a lot of noise and uh, strange, uh, strange sort of interactions with our telephone line. And then the connection was so slow that just downloading a single picture was an absolute nightmare. Whereas now we are all almost as if we were in the same room uh, discussing the internet through uh, the internet. That also means that the internet uh, and digital technology more broadly has come to occupy a fundamental and central position in our social life, in our economic life, and in our uh, political life. And that means, in turn, something very important. Um, there is a famous document from around the early days of the internet, uh, the Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace, which claimed that cyberspace was a completely new area for human activity in which governments had very little of a role to play. And much of the professional and commercial ethic that emerged around the internet was very much based on those libertarian notions. Now, what we see in the meantime is that governments around the world have decided that that no longer is no longer in a situation where 
governments, and certainly in the West, by and large, believe that you cannot, but also you shouldn't regulate online processes to a situation where nearly every important aspect of the digital world world is becoming subject to scrutiny. And in some cases, that is for reasons that I think very many people can get behind, uh, both in uh, China and in Europe, for instance, a lot of our uh, anti -comp uh, anti-monopoly law, our competition protection law, and our personal information protection related legislation serves to protect individual users, serves to protect th uh, the functioning of markets within that environment. But more broadly, we also see that questions of security, and not just cyber security in the narrow sense, as in security from hacks, attacks, and other forms of unauthorized intrusion, but also broader questions surrounding economic security, information security, ideological security, have come to the forefront uh, of uh, the discussion. And to a very significant degree, that is because the digital is now everywhere. Uh, and I fully predict that maybe in another five years or so, we're not really going to talk anymore about the digital as a separate category, in the sense that the digital economy economy will by and large be the economy, our digital strategy will be our strategy, and our digital security will be our security. Now, when you get that sort of integration of the digital with nearly all important aspects of human life, uh, you then get a process that we're seeing now, which I'm, uh, I sometimes refer to as normalization, where we no longer treat the digital sphere as that uh, 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 as that completely that space for human activity, as John Perry Barlow um, uh, discussed, but we treat the digital sphere as if it were normal. So that can happen at a very micro level, for instance, about discussions about whether Uber drivers and DD drivers are employees and so are subject to all the other employment protections that the law institutes or whether tech is something special. We also, for instance, see it with energy, right, um, where a lot of the discussion around uh, new and strategic forms of energy generation closely connected to the digital sphere um, are being normalized in the sense that what once was the geopolitics of oil may now well become the geopolitics of batteries and semiconductors. And we see countries reorganizing their actions around access to these strategic resources. We see the internet being ever more seen as uh, another source of risk with the added problem that the internet is always on. And so the contact surface and therefore the possible target surface, but also the possible surface of irritation between major players worldwide is constantly there. And us as thinkers, experts, specialists, governments, businesses, in a way we've only just started uh, of discovery on exactly what this transformation will mean organize and operate our states, the way that our companies work, the way that we haven't just shaped the internet, but the internet is shaping and reshaping up us. And to conclude, I would like to share a thought uh, from an American colleague of mine, Jay Healy, who at our conference last year said, it has taken societies about 400 years to digest uh, the introduction of movable type printing and the information revolution that that caused in Renaissance Europe. With the internet, we're only 30 years along. So we can only imagine how much time we still have to go and how much uh, interesting matters await our further discovery and exploration. I very much look forward to doing that uh, with a lot of people, many of which are in this room. Uh, and thank you again uh, for your invitation. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rohir. Um, you did manage to capture really well the nat nature of the changes that uh, we see today, especially this idea of the internet from a space of freedom to a space of uh, 
uh, risk and this security twist that we are seeing in many discussions that we have in the digital scenario, including economic security, which in the base was to guarantee uh, access to the resources necessary to the growth of the population of our companies. And it has become uh, pretty much about security uh, of states, which uh, frame things in a very confrontational way, I'm afraid. Let me move uh, to my colleague, Sorina Teleano, who developed an excellent research uh, some years uh, uh, ago on the participation of China in standardization processes. Sarina, over to you, perhaps uh, for you to tell us a little bit about uh, the findings of that research, which became a real reference in this area. Sarina. Thank you, Marilia. Um, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Yes, I'll take a few steps back and um, go to the very first part of your question about goals and priorities and look a bit at technical standards because we do talk a lot about policy and regulation and whatnot these days around digital issues, but we tend to forget about the more technical um, side of things and technical standards do have a role to play there. And at Diplo, we like to think of standards as some sort of a bridge between technology and policy. And we do encourage diplomats here in Geneva and elsewhere to pay a bit more attention to the technical side of things again. Um, so going back to the original questions and what are some of the priorities and goals of China when it comes to technical standardization, and how are these reflected at an um, international level? There were a few points mentioned earlier about how um, over the past two decades, China has been focusing on becoming and now being, I guess, a global tech power, an innovation-driven economy capable of developing and exporting um, high-end technology. This um, also came with a growing attention to tech standards. So China does um, see standards as a key element in driving this kind of innovation, industrial development, and also economic growth, a key element in facilitating economic and trade exchanges, and obviously essential for China's growing uh, competitiveness on the global market. Um, so there are three main goals when it comes to the policy for international engagement and cooperation around technical standards. Um, and we looked particularly at standards related to digital technologies, um, internet, artificial intelligence, quantum and whatnot. So these three goals, active participation in international standardization processes, strengthened bilateral and multilateral standards cooperation, and some sort of harmonization between Chinese and international standards in two ways, uh, both the so-called internationalization of Chinese standards and technology, and then the transposition of standards adopted at international level at um, a national level. I'll try to focus a little on the participation in international standardization processes. Um, and you know, there are these three key um, organizations here in Geneva, ITU with um, ITUT, and also with the standardization around radio communication at ITUR. Um, ISO, the International Organization for Standardization, and IEC, the Electrotechnical Commission. And there are a few other international standard setting bodies elsewhere, like ITF, since we're talking about the internet now, the um, Internet Engineering Task Force. So what we've seen, um, starting from the late um, 1970s, when China um, started being more active again in international organizations, for some 20 years, there was a bit of this learning approach. Okay, we're going to be there. We're going to understand what others are doing and try to contribute. But since early 2000s, we have seen a shift um, and a new focus on actually contributing to standard um, development. And this is also something that has been mentioned earlier. So from learning and taking up standards that others have developed through actually being um, an active contributor to the shaping and development of these um, standards. And looking at some of the policy documents that have been adopted over the years, um, also around standardization, there is this overall goal of having a more active participation in international standardizations, again, with a focus on these three main um, entities, ITU, ISO, and IEC. And if we have time later on, we can explain a bit why um, there is a focus not only from China, but also from other actors around the world on these three main organizations. Um, I was looking this morning at the statistics from the um, ITF, again, the International Electronic uh, uh, Internet um, Engineering Task Force. Um, I think it's no surprise for anyone that for a long time, most of the contributions to ITF um, came from um, the US. That's where the internet initially was developed. But um, interestingly, over the past 10 years, we've seen 
quite an interesting um, shift there. And now there is some sort of um, similar amount of contributions from the US, from China and from the EU. It's really interesting to look at um, this graph, how it has been um, changing over the years. It shows not only that China and the EU have increased participation, but also that participation and engagement from the US itself has dropped a bit. So um, also something to keep in mind when we look at some more active engagement from um, actors. What does it mean in the context of um, lower participation from other um, actors? So what is this um, growing focus on international standardization about? It's about coming up with more standard proposals, about trying to take um, the so-called leadership position, be it secretariat of a study group um, or a rapporteur for a specific work item. Um, we have also seen quite a lot of mirroring of technical committees at a national level, the international technical committees. Um, and what I do like in some way is this focus on encouraging and supporting participation of um, national actors to be involved in um, international standardization. And I was just coming across this morning on this um, policy, which is called Special Action Plan for Standardization Talent Development. So basically also um, supporting the development of capacities to be more active in international and also national standardization, which I think could also be something that other countries might be looking into including in the context of um, a stronger engagement in um, international standardization. And my final point on the priorities for international um, standard setting. Um, again, this morning I was trying to read some of the most recent documents and I came across these key points for national standardization work in 2024, which has an entire section about international um, engagement and digital economy and contribution to the development of standards around the digital economy is there high among the priority. And it's no surprise that we're seeing quite a lot of engagement in the development around standards for artificial intelligence, um, for quantum, for biotech, and for these kind of technologies where standardization is still um, in the early stages. So China is trying to have a more um, strong voice there. Um, I'll stop here and maybe we can have um, questions and answers later on. Thank you, Marilia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sorina. As I mentioned, it was a really in-depth uh, study uh, that I recommend we take a look to discuss standardization uh, in general, not only the participation um, of China. And there are more and more researchers who are deciding to work uh, with uh, standards. I think it was an area that was seen as too technical in the beginning, but we see that standards also have repercussions, not only um, in the economy, but also in other areas of digital policy, uh, in rights, for example. Uh, I would recommend that as well a very good study by Dr. Kat Spett. Uh, she did an uh, ethnographic study of uh, IETF and the practices of participation there. And it was an amazing study that she conducted for two or three years of participating in meetings. I think I am going to um, uh, change uh, a little bit the dynamics and turn perhaps to Susonia um, at this moment, because I have seen that there has been some action in the chat and just mindful of time to make sure that we have time to reflect on the questions. Um, perhaps uh, uh, Susonia could uh, read a few questions, summarize, not to read them, but summarize them um, for us. And then when I turn back to you for the third block, if you can, you can already uh, reflect on some of these uh, questions if you wish to make sure that we will cover them. So, Sonia, if you're ready, can you please come in? Um, can you hear me right now? Yes. Yes. Okay, so um, there was quite a bit of discussion uh, about the very, very first online connection, the first internet connection in China, and it's been uh, replied in detail, and it seems like the first internet connection is the NCFC connection by Chinese Academy of Sciences in 1994, but probably the first dial-up connection ever would be around 1989. For more details, um, you can look at the uh, chat for anyone who's interested, and then we had Quite a few other interesting questions uh, around uh, China's approach to internet regulation and its uh, evolution throughout the last few decades and uh, the implications of China's internet governance model to safeguard the flow of ideas, cre creativity and innovation. And another good question was, um, what was the what's the role of the Great Firewall um, in, in shaping the online experience for Chinese citizens and businesses? 
So these are the questions that uh, stood towards us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sonia. If we have time at the end, uh, I will collect a few more. Um, now we have a third part of our discussion uh, in which we will look a little bit at the future. Um, and uh, and uh, the title of this, uh, this uh, part of the discussion was uh, meaningfully from interdependence to independence, what are the futures, uh, future opportunities and challenges? Um, it was interesting to see that a few years ago, uh, the UN Secretary uh, General Panel on Digital Cooperation launched a report that was titled The Age of Digital um, Interdependence. And the content is still uh, very relevant, of course, but if we look at the title, perhaps it feels a little bit um, outdated today for the trends that we are discussing in terms of fragmentation of uh, regulation um, and also the trends that the WTO itself has identified in terms of the value uh, chains being reshaped in order to foster more robustness, uh, resilience, uh, ideas such as uh, friend shoring, for instance, coming to play, um, and the tension that has been uh, rising uh, around uh, platforms and so on. Um, so uh, some questions that I would like to mention to you, and perhaps I will uh, mention them uh, um, one by one, and whoever wants can come in and react. Let's do it more like a free flow um, conversation. The first question was about uh, the Sino-American uh, relation and how different countries, but not just US and China, but we see that in the European Union as well, um, in the economic security strategy, they're putting a lot of emphasis on critical and emerging technologies and seeing it from a security perspective. And that includes, of course, artificial intelligence. Um, if you could uh, perhaps share th some thoughts or reactions on how this uh, impacts the governance of artificial intelligence um, in the future, in your perspective. Um, over to you, whoever wants to come in. Okay, uh, I could be the first one. Okay, I'll be second. <laughs> Uh, okay, so at the beginning, when we have a new emerging technology, everyone wanted to grab opportunity to be the first one, to be the super powerful one. It's a, it's a natural, not just the rose best student in the, in the classroom, but also in the global arena for the for the international community. I understand, but you cannot take that position all the time. So when the market is becoming is expanding, you have to share your emerging uh, technology with your partners and that will spread and will uh, uh, balance such of uh, the, the 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 power so at the beginning we have a pioneer and then we have a different groups and then we have big market so that uh, the international community have to stay together to enjoy the beauty that the emerging technology may bring to the global community i'm quite op optimistic to the future of uh, such a competition when we come to say that uh, it's the same that we have a competition between United States and China, sometimes Europe and the United States, it's 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 natural. It's but it's good because we have different choices, so that we may test different solutions with competition. We 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 are not the god. We don't have critical uh, crystal ball. So we need to let different things, different solutions to happen, and then we could compare. It is not uh, the uh, option A not option B, it is a combination of uh, different options. So this is uh, like, uh, that, like uh, the, the evolving of uh, the um, natural environment. We need to let it happen naturally, but definitely we also need to take the cost. I will stop here. Thank you, Professor Liu Hao. Who wants to come in into this question? Yeah, I just want to give my uh, consideration on this topic. You know, if you look at the future, of course, that uh, the AI, uh, I mean, the AIGC is a hot topic for competition among those countries, especially for China and US. Um, not only uh, a competition for the chips, um, but also for the data. So I, I think if we look at the future, I, I don't think that China is a competitor for American because, you know, uh, we are lack of the chips and lack of the data, and in some sense, we lack of the computing powers. So, so uh, in the past 30 years, uh, what we have learned from the internet development in China is we 
uh, try to use the new technologies maybe uh, developed by other countries and, and merge into the Chinese market to be, build a new business model to earn money. But of course, now we have more technologies and more, more talent. But compared to other countries, we are still not the real competitor, even for the AI in the next five to 10 years. So if we uh, adjust the good then I think very in last November to have a lot of discussion with the entrepreneurs and investors, I think that maybe China is lack, you know, just behind American two or three years. You know, two or three years is a very long, long history for, for this industry. You know, one point one point five year is one generation, maybe two or three years is two generations for the technology. It is I think it's terrible for China, but yes, I I think it's a reality. So, so for for China, I I do believe that in the future, in the next ten years, China need to be much more open than before. How to to copy the model for the past three years? How to attract more capital, more talent, and more technology into Chinese market, and to try to use the AI technology. Of course, I would encourage the the entrepreneurs to 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 try to invest a lot for the research. As uh, uh, Serena mentioned, that for the techn technical standard, you know, in the past thirty years, there are only less than four percent of the internet standard was made by Chinese people, maybe only three percent. You know, the first uh, RFC was published by Tsinghua University, and I contributed for the second and third one. But up to now, there are only about three hundred or less than four hundred standard was made by Chinese people. It's very 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 little and it's especially for the ai governance and ai standard i think it's also is a big challenge for for chinese community so i think it's, we need to to look at the reality and also chinese china itself try to find the reality try to to come down and uh, to do more works on itself and uh, how to use the uh, new technologies and uh, raise the open policy. Thank you, Professor Li. Uh, it seems to me from uh, what you said, and Professor Liu how uh, mentioned as well, that the way forward is to develop technology and to develop these critical technologies. We need somehow to reinforce um, interdependence because we will need access to technology, we will need access to capital, and that means uh, perhaps more than less globalization. Um, but at the same time, we are discussing from a broader perspective, not only technology, deglobalization and trends. And one of the latest reports from the WTO actually calls for reglobalization um, of, of international trade and identifies that any bottlenecks that we have that have been identified since uh, uh, COVID in terms of value chains should be tackled by having more robust, diversified and more trades with more partners rather than uh, less partners. So how do you think, and that's a question that uh, I, I will perhaps uh, um, forward to you, how to counter any fragmentation trends that we see um, in the digital economy today and reinforce this interdependence that you're talking about? Let's uh, perhaps try to be a little bit more um, practical in terms of what would be the mechanisms, what would be the ways of cooperation among countries that we should perhaps explore um, from now on if we want all to develop these technologies that would be necessary for our digital economies together. And again, I open to anyone who wants to react. If, if I try to give some... Uh uh reaction for your for your questions you know i think that if wto uh uh want to emphasize the re-globalization of the international trade so the key point is how to make sure we can have the global data flow around the world so but you know now if we compare to the traditional uh international trade policy so every country try to uh, encourage the international trade but now there is a big challenge because maybe people is lack of knowledge to know what the real data is. But now there's so many limitation for data flow. So you know, in 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 China, we have some kind of policy to ask the enterprise to store store the, the data in, uh, domestically, and also America has similar kind of, similar kind of policy, and even in Europe, if we cannot to, to have the global data flow, how we can have the globalized international trade? 
because everything is relevant to data. In, in some sense, data is relevant to, relevant to every, everything. So, so the, 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 the currently, you know, if we want to have the real and re-globalization, so how to make sure we can have an interoperable data security or data governance policy, try to make sure, um, which is respect to the, to the uh, uh, country uh, security issues, but we need to encourage the data, data interoperability uh, globally. That's very important, both in policy layer, but also in technology traffic layer. Absolutely. Jovan, please go ahead. Oh, yep. I was just disconnected for a few minutes. Uh, my lithium supply was very low and, uh, and got this connection. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, the one question is that uh, old narrative that internet by its nature is interdependent is dying. And it's dying for uh, for the reason that I think eloquently was uh, um, explained by Professor Roger, by Roger uh, that uh, we have now real interests which are uh, in the internet world. Now, the key issue is, can governments make an informed decision if they are benefiting more from interdependence or independence? That's the key issue when it comes to infrastructure, economic development, to the maybe trivial issues that grandma somewhere in the Balkans in Africa is connected to grandchildren somewhere in the United States or Europe, or big 80 million plus uh, Chinese diaspora community. There are on all levels that these dilemmas between internet, but they come with informed decision. And I think the previous narrative that internet by its nature, it's uh, interconnected and it will bypass everything, it, it is dying, obviously. Uh, but we have now to make new social contract and say, yes, we want to be interdependent and we will support it legally, politically, and we will be fair and there will be uh, um, uh, sort of global rules of the game. Somebody, one friend of mine, when I told him about the event, he asked me one interesting question. He said, there is a TikTok in China. What about uh, a similar service uh, in the uh, US? What about similar services in China? Which is a legitimate question. And that probably uh, will have to be, those issues have to be uh, addressed in very, with utmost clarity, with utmost understanding what are the priorities and interests for countries. Therefore, that would be for me the great uh, development that we come to the clarity of discussion and reduce any sort of uh, um, noise around it, like a noise that for a long time that the internet is by, by, its, uh, by its own technical facility bypassing all barriers. Yes, that could help, but uh, it is basically part of uh, human decisions to use it or not to use it. That would be my, my take on it. More clarity more fair, more uh, honest and open discussion, which are related to the concrete economic, uh, social, and ultimately also geopolitical interests. Thank you, Jovan, for these reflections. Uh, so Sonia called my attention that we have uh, questions in the chat. So we have a few minutes left. Uh, left. I will invite her to um, forward these questions, and then I will ask remaining questions, and um, we can uh, wrap up after that. So, Sonia, please go ahead. And Torina, there is a question on standardization in the chat. If you want to take a look, perhaps, on your final remarks, you can take that one. So, Sonia, please. Yes. Um, we've talked about the internet shaping us in return as we shape it. And uh, the question was... This effect is mostly seen in language and in dichotomies. So, and human interaction is facilitated for technology uh, increasingly. Uh, is what what's happening in English also happening in Chinese? Uh, is the question. And would you like me to? I would also read the last ones uh, out here. And what steps can be can be taken to promote greater transparency, inclusivity, and accountability in the process of developing and implementing digital standards on a global scale. And one last question was on how, how are other stakeholders and countries are engaging with China in digital standard setting processes and while influencing outcomes? Thank you very much, uh, so Sonia. We had uh, two questions left that I will throw. And again, um, if you take them, please, uh, it's, it will be your concluding remarks as well. Um, one is about the role of Europe. If you see 
in this conversation, we focus a lot on US and China, but uh, the role of Europe in terms as a in terms of a bridge, a builder, and a uh, uh, region that has a lot of gravitas when it comes to uh, regulation and uh, and in the digital sphere. And one last question about uh, moving forward. What are the common policy goals that we could identify um, that are the same uh, in China, in the West, that could uh, perhaps present us with a positive way of win-win cooperation and collaboration and that would foster more interdependence, more integration, um, and and not contribute to fragmentation as we have been talking about. So perhaps, uh, um, and please address any questions that Susonia uh, also asked. Uh, your final remarks, if you want to step in on these ones. Marilia, I can give it a try also because I have to run to another meeting quickly. <laughs> Um, on the last question you just raised, I was thinking about this very, very recent UNGA resolution on AI for sustainable development, which was quite impressive to look at um, how it started, you know, as a US um, suggested draft resolution. And then it gained support from basically everyone within the UN, including China. And I think there are um, a few areas where we can all agree that we do have common goals. Um, and this UNGA resolution is one example of that. Uh, picking up on some of the questions in chat, how do geopolitical tensions and rivalries between China and other major powers impact discussions? Uh, they clearly do. Um, and the case study also analyzed, Marilia, in your paper around the new IP and a few other discussions around facial recognition technologies. Those are a very clear reflection of how these geopolitical tensions have influenced more technical discussions. And I think we have both um, criticized um, some of these approaches. So um, we do encourage you to take a look at those more critical um, analysis of these two um, and a few other cases. And on your last point, I think one thing we tend to forget uh, when we talk about international standardization is that these international standards are developed on the basis of consensus. And the major international standardization organizations do have very clear rules and procedures that no one is actually um, breaking, or at least we haven't um, found an example of a breaking of these rules. So this um, transparency and accountability, I think they do work. It's more of a matter of looking at who's there, who's not there, and then uh, maybe not blaming who's there for um, what's happening because others are missing. Um, I hope this makes sense, but giving the floor back to others. Thank you. Thank you, Sorina. Uh, perhaps the Professor Rohir, would you like to react um, on this last comments and make your concluding remarks as well? Well, uh, only to say, uh, 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 being mindful uh, of the time, that I think there's this really interesting sort of, we have these different sets of governance questions, right? When we go to standardization, what we try to do is solve engineering problems very often related to interoperability. Um, for a very long time, that worked rather well and no one cared about it. But increasingly, what we see is also that standards have economic value, right? Standards reflect intellectual property that can be extremely valuable uh, once it's deployed. And certainly for a country like China, uh, gaining a greater share of that value um, is uh, essential uh, to its uh, future growth strategy and its um, its its um, ambitions to continue to to increase uh, its prosperity. And so this is, I think, going to be the very interesting question. W to what extent can we still sort of say this is technical? Not really, because what we see is everything, all of these things are becoming far more politicized as we start recognizing more and more, you know, the second and third and fourth order effects of all of these technological process. Uh, I don't have the answer uh, to all of these questions. If I did, my house would be a little bit bigger. But at least we know that we we cannot simply think you know everything is becoming politicized we should go we should just go back to the way things were because where because that we knew that and that was a lot more comfortable i think we're going to have to live with this and find ways through and that's going to be a lot more challenging but i i just don't see any other way thank you very much professor liu hao perhaps 30 seconds of your final remarks thank you. Uh, okay thank you for the international standard making i couldn't agree more with uh, sorina it is there, the rules is clear, it is accepted by the whole world. Don't need to change, just get engaged. Secondly, it is the problem was not caused by the talk, technology, caused by the culture. 
and the politics, but the common goals for every government on this world is to serve the people. But it is uh, the difference that serve the people in wh in which country. But we need to serve the people around the world. If we ch if you change the goal, you know how to get engaged with the global community and try to find uh, the inter dependent uh, solutions and not just uh, try to separate it from the, 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 the world. And for I, I read the questions on the on the chat. I know so many people have uh, quite a lot of uh, 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 interest for China. Come to China and also uh, when we come to uh, see each other in the world, I will share my experience. So don't don't feel shy to ask rows of uh, hot questions. I am ready to answer the question in the future. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Shandong Li. Yeah, I think it's a day because we discussed the history of China Yunnan. We I can give some remarks uh, for the future. You know, in the first two or three decades for the global internet, China is absent uh, in this community because China connected the internet in 1994. But in the past the 30 uh, years, in the three decades, so China uh, is the biggest uh, internet market. So the Chinese uh, company uh, earn a lot of money with the business model and recruit more talent, uh, doing a lot of technical R&D. So now in the future, maybe uh, one or two decades, they want to deliver their technology and want to contribute their technology to the global community. That means if you have more engagement for the standard processing, so that, I think that should be a good news because they, they, they will not only compute money, uh, compute the model, and also compute the technologies. I think they need more collaboration with the community, global community, how to make sure that engagement is for the rules and also uh, do the real contribution for the internet development uh, for the world. Thank you very much. And I will call Jovan to close this discussion and say the final words. Marilia, I was worried a few days ago when I read that Chinese and U.S. scientists agreed that Internet will destroy us during some meeting in Beijing. I, I disagreed with the team, but the good news is that uh, Chinese and U.S. scientists agreed about, uh, in my wrong conclusion, that, well, that was the that was promising news. I think there is a need for more talk. There is a need for more respect for uh, for uh, the other opinion, clarity and openness in discussion. Media does not help a lot. Media often simplifies the issues on uh, us and them, my opinion and wrong opinion, and I don't think it's not healthy. But if we can foster this type of discussions uh, in as we had today and in other fora, I think it can. Uh, it's a promising sign, and that is my. Uh, Conclusion for the future, not only of China, but of the rest of the world and the future internet developments. Thank you very much, Jovan. Sorry, everybody, for going two minutes over time. And thank you very much for attending this discussion. Uh, have a good celebration tomorrow to all our Chinese uh, friends. And this uh, video will be available so you can review the discussion if you arrived in the middle of it. And thank you very much for your participation. See you again next time for 